Hi everyone, and welcome back to Voyage of a Time Wanderer. Today, I'm going to be sharing my top 5 reads from 2017. So, this is the first part of my 2017 wrap-up series. I'm going to do two parts. The first part is this top 5 reads, and then the second part is going to be um, a review of all the books I read and then like some stats and kind of an overall wrap-up. These top five are not going to be in any particular order because it was hard enough to choose just five books and I don't think it would be possible for me to rank them. So I read 50 books so my top five is I guess the best 10% of the books that I read in 2017. I think I only have a physical copy of one of them so the rest I'm going to try to do that fancy thin where a picture of the cover should hopefully appear over here while I'm talking. But let me start by talking about uh, the book that I actually own a physical copy of, which is Homegoing by Yag Gassi. It's a debut by a Ghanaian author and it is also uh, a family saga, which is one of my favorite types of books. So between being African literature and historical fiction slash family saga, this was a shoe in to be uh, one of my top five favorites. This book starts off following uh, two half-sisters in a traditional Ghanaian village about maybe four, 400 years ago, about? And then it travels, it follows each generation of their descendants' lives, seeing how they mirror or don't mirror each other. So one of the sisters um, gets abducted and taken into slavery in uh, America, and the other sister stays in Ghana. So, so one sister's descendants go through uh, slavery in the United States and then um, showcase different struggles of African Americans in America. And one sister's descendant stays in Ghana and has a traditional village life for a few generations and then goes through colonialism, uh, fighting for independence, and some of the post-independence political conflict that Ghana has um, come through. So it's a really excellent novel if you like African literature, if you like stories that follow families through the ages. Uh, I love those kind of books where you get little snippets of different historical time periods. Each chapter is only one generation forward, sometimes they'd mention uh, their parents or grandparents and you'd learn a little bit more about how how the life of the character that you got invested in in the first in the previous chapter had changed it was just a really well written book about ordinary people and families going through history the next book is one that i don't have a physical copy for uh, it and it is the anatomy lesson by nina Siegel. this book is set in the dutch golden age and similar to girl with a pearl earring it focuses on um telling the story of a painting and in this case, it's The Anatomy Lesson by Rembrandt. Um, this book actually takes place over a single day, the day of the sitting of the painting. However, there are flashbacks where you get more insight into the character's past. And it's told from multiple perspectives. So uh, it's told from the perspective of Rembrandt, from one of the top um, physicians in the Physicians Guild that has commissioned Rembrandt to paint this portrait. Um, I think there's an errand boy that it follows. It follows the wife of uh, a man convicted in the court system to die, and it follows the convicted man, who ends up obviously being the dead body that Rembrandt uses as a model in his painting. Uh, there may be a few other characters, I can't remember. can't remember everyone, but it was just such a fast-paced read because it was set over the course of a single day, and it kept switching perspectives, so you'd get a little further ahead, and then you'd go back and jump back to how this person perceived something. I listened to it on audiobook, and I think that also helped because the different perspectives had different uh, voices or accents put on by the narrator, and so that really also helped get me into the book and get connected to each individual character. Um, I thought it was really well executed, because sometimes when a book is written from too many perspectives I find it hard to keep track of who's who, but this one because everyone was interacting with each other and going through the same day's events, I found it really easy to keep track of. So if you like Girl with a Pearl Earring, if you're interested in the Dutch Golden Age, and if you like books based around painting, I would definitely recommend this. Overall, it was just a really heartbreaking but enjoyable read. The third book on my top five is The Headmaster's Wager by Vincent Lamb. And I think I talked about this in one of my Friday Reads videos last year. The main character is part of the Chinese diaspora in Vietnam, and he's following in the footsteps of his father, who established a, a rice company there. And when the main character moved from China to Vietnam, he took over his father's business and converted the rice factory building and turned it into a Chinese school for members of the diaspora community. 
then we follow kind of his story through the entire Vietnamese war. Obviously it's a very different perspective to the Vietnamese war than one that we're used to because it's not told from either the Vietnamese or the American side. It's told from the point of view of a Chinese person living in Vietnam so he's somewhat considers himself as a neutral or third party observer to the conflict of the war. His school is based out of Saigon, which is now called Ho Chi Minh City, so for part of the war he's quite distant from it, quite distant from the actual conflict, but inevitably the war comes to his doorstep and he has to deal with shifting loyalties and trying to find out who to trust, while also dealing with some family conflict with his ex-wife, his teenage son who gets in trouble with the authorities and ends up escaping back to China during the middle of Mao's cultural revolution, and then a Vietnamese lady that he falls in love with and starts a second family with. So he's having to juggle a lot of relationships, both personal and political, uh, in the middle of this war that is threatening to engulf everything that he knows. Then the fourth book in my top five of 2017 is Rilla of Ingleside by L.M. Montgomery. And this book is actually the only contemporary account of women in Canada during World War I. Uh, this is the, la the eighth and final book in the Anna Green Gables series. And it follows her daughter Rilla, who is coming of age as a teenager and has to deal with her watching her brothers and classmates and crushes go off to war while also navigating just general issues of teenagehood and coming into adulthood back on the home front in the maritime provinces of Canada. It was really interesting to read a book written during and just after World War I uh, because it doesn't have some of the larger perspectives that contemporary World War I novels have. Obviously when it was written, um, Montgomery didn't know that World War II was coming up. She didn't know that this wasn't going to be like the last great war. It was written by an author who had just gone through all these same experiences, dealing with family members, loved ones and community members, struggling through the effects of war on the home front. It was a book that I really wanted to get to during the World War I uh, centennial commemorations, so I was happy to get to that and to finish the Anna Green Gables series this year. So if you like World War I fiction, if you like examining war through a female lens, and if you like contemporary accounts of war, I think this would be a great read for you. My fifth and final pick for my favorite books of 2017 is The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. Earlier in the year I read Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, and while I really loved the first half, I didn't like the second half as much, and I was looking for a more realistic feeling uh, book and ending, and I found that in The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, which follows a young man and a woman who moves into an abandoned manor house with her son, and they start to be friends, and obviously there's an attraction that develops when she tells him that she has a secret that she needs to reveal, and she gives him her diary to read. And then we jump back into her diary for the second half of the book. Uh, we learn about what circumstances brought her to have to be living under a, a pseudonym on the moors of England in this abandoned manor house. I just thought it was beautifully, beautifully written. The scenery was vivid. I could feel all the characters' emotions. And I really was rooting for the ending that happened. So those are the top five books that I read during 2017. And be sure to check out the second part of my wrap-up, which will be coming up, which will be my Goodreads wrap-up and some stats on my reading during the past year. One thing that I found kind of interesting when I was just reading through my top five list now is that they're all either historical fiction or classics. So I guess you can tell uh, what kind of reading I enjoy the most. Let me know what your favorite books were of 2017, and until next time, enjoy wandering through the pages of a good book. Bye.